Hi, I'm Cheryl Kagan, very proud to be the Senator for Rockville and Gaithersburg. Delighted to be welcoming to this week's episode of Kibitzing with Kagan, the Federal Election Commissioner, Ellen Weintraub. Ellen, Madam Commissioner, thank you so much for joining me today for a chat. So delighted to be here. I love the title of your podcast. Thank you, thanks, it's fun. So I have about a million questions to ask you, and I think it's gonna be a very wide ranging and engaging conversations that, conversation that my viewers will enjoy. First, I have to show you my very favorite campaign button of all time. And that is uh, something I'm pulling out for you today. Vote or you have nobody to blame but yourself. And we are gonna be talking about a very boring issue today, which is elections, not in the news at all. Um, so, but I do wanna start uh, with your background, which is fascinating. Um, there's the traditional part, which is um, clerking and working for, uh, working on Capitol Hill for the ethics committee, having worked for several different prestigious law firms. Uh, but I'm actually curious to go back even further, uh, which is your BA at Yale in British Studies. And I'm wondering, can you just tell us briefly how you chose that and how, if at all, that that's applicable to your career? It was the broadest subject that I could come up with, and it gave me a good excuse to spend a semester in London. So that's that good. was I like it, I like it, very good. So a lot of times when people go to liberal arts schools like Yale, like Vassar, uh, they wonder how, how they'll ever get a job or how they'll ever have a career. So you have had an extraordinary career. So let's talk about the Federal Election Commission, the FEC. Not everyone knows about this agency. So why don't you start with a little bit of background as to what it is, what it does, and why it's so important to our democracy. The FEC was created in the wake of the Watergate scandal in the 1970s. We were created to follow the money. And that is our foremost mission is to make public and make sure that we have an informed electorate about where the money is coming from and where it's going that supports all of our candidates. Every candidate, every party committee, every super PAC now, although those didn't exist in the 1970s, has to file regular reports with the FEC disclosing where they get their money from, who their donors are, and, uh, and what they're spending their money on. And I think that is critical to having an informed electorate. People need to know where the money's coming from. Amen. Now it is a multi-partisan agency with six members. Uh, why don't you talk about that and the partisanship that is or is not featured on the FEC? It is a six member body and by law, no more than three can be of any one political party. Right now we have three Republicans, two Democrats and one independent who caucuses with the Democrats. And uh, partisanship uh, was in the minds of Congress when they set the body up. They were concerned that uh, whatever the party in power would be would not be able to control the agency and penalize financially their opponents because we do have an enforcement function. But what has happened over the years is a different kind of partisanship that I don't think anyone ever anticipated, which was that one party has now sort of taken it as party doctrine that they don't like campaign finance regulations and that they are just opposed to enforcement enforcing the law in general. So uh, we've had a big uptick in the last number of years in the number of split votes that just go down 3-3 three, three on, on party lines. And in virtually every one of them, regardless of who is the subject of the complaint, it is the Republicans who are voting not to move forward on the, on the complaint and the Democrats and the Independent who are voting to move forward to do some investigation to try and figure out what happened or perhaps to penalize someone who appears to have violated the law. Mm. So uh, and a, that's not what was anticipated. Right. And a 3-3 ruling would mean... Nothing. Nothing no, happens. Nothing it happens. It takes four votes to start an investigation, to enter into negotiations, to try and settle a matter, to uh, do a rulemaking, to issue an advisory opinion. All of our important functions require four votes. So tell me about your journey in elections. Do you remember the first time you ever cast a ballot and what about it was important to you? Well, that was probably back home in Queens, where I grew up on one of those great big machines that they have in New York, or they, they used to, where you walk into your own little booth and you pull the curtain and there are all these levers. It was really wonderful. And, and, and you could really feel like you were 
of doing something right. uh, in there. Um, I, uh, I don't remember who the first candidates were that I voted for, but I have voted in every single election since I, I turned 18 and have become eligible to vote. And when my, uh, when I grew older and had a family. I brought my kids with me to the polling station here in Maryland, uh, where I've been uh, uh, living for the last number of years. I was trying to inculcate you. that same sense in them of how important it is to vote every single time. Amen. I remember going in that booth with the poll lever and stuff uh, when I was in the, my teens, actually with my mother and going to vote. And that is such an important message and sort of communicating the vitally important job that you have as American to cast a ballot. So, uh, so you were appointed during the Bush administration to the Federal Election Commission. Uh, tell me about what interested you about the FEC and how hard was it to be the democratic choice for the Bush uh, folks, the Bush White House? Well, traditionally, commissioners are appointed in pairs. So uh, there's one Democrat and one Republican, and that makes confirmation a little bit easier because everybody's got somebody that they want to vote to confirm. Um, that's um, that has changed a little bit in the last number of years. But uh, as a uh, as I said, no more than three can be of any one political party. So the seat that I was appointed to. I was replacing another Democrat, and there was no question that it would be another Democrat who would go into that seat. Although I was appointed by then President George W. Bush, I was recommended for that position by then Senate Democratic leader Tom Daschle. Nice. And that, that's how it used to go, where the if you the president picks the people from his or her party and the uh, the the opposition leader in the Senate tends to have a strong role in picking the people from the other party. You know, I don't know this and I should have, but I, I, are you Danny McDonald's successor? No, I replaced Carl Sandstrom. I overlapped with Danny by a couple of years. Okay, okay. The longest serving commissioner ever, Danny McDonald. I knew him a million years ago. Everybody knew Danny. Yes. Why don't you talk about the biggest changes that you've seen that you think have had the biggest impact since your appointment in 2002? Well, I think the, the, the biggest impact really has been the role of technology mm -hmm. uh, on politics and on disclosure. Um, back when the agency was created, if you wanted to see the disclosure reports, you literally had to come into the building and go to our public disclosure room. And we had records on microfiche, which <laughs> nobody even knows what that is anymore. But we're, we're, we're digitizing all of those old records. But um, now, of course, anybody can get access to the records at their homes, wherever they have a computer, on their phones, for that matter. Um, and I think that's that's good. It's opened up the uh, the information to more people. Anybody can find out, and it's a it's a pretty good website. But uh, we also have. Um, sort of partners in the um, nonprofit sphere who take the information and also do great analysis of it. People like opensecrets.org, the Center for Responsive uh, Politics, um, take uh, our information. A lot of journalists use our information and everything that you read in the newspaper about how much money is being raised and spent, who's, who's supporting which candidates, all of that comes from the information that we collect at the FEC. So uh, having that be more accessible to people, I think, is important. But of course, the internet has also affected politics in some ways that were not so positive. Uh, it's been a place where a lot of disinformation and misinformation has spread about elections. And uh, as an agency, whose fundamental mission is transparency, that also bothers me that all this information is out there and people can't always tell where it's coming from. Well, let's stay on that for a moment uh, because the big lie, as the media has taken to calling it, and uh, we see you on MSNBC and elsewhere and you're a fabulous spokesperson. Uh, what is the answer? How does the FEC help to correct the record on that? Well, we don't we don't really have a formal role in uh, in correcting the record on that. We don't administer the elections. The right. elections are administered throughout the country by state and local officials who did a sensational job in 2020 in the in the midst of a pandemic. I was really worried at the beginning of 2020 that uh, 
we were not going to be able to run uh, a safe and accessible election. And instead, everyone stepped up. The uh, state and local administrators around the country were creative and innovative. They uh, increased people's opportunities to vote by mail and by drop boxes and used a lot of techniques. There is no evidence, I know you know this, Cheryl, there is no evidence of any kind of substantial fraud that would have affected the outcome of the election. It, in fact, we had record turnout and uh, it, was, it was really a, um, a, a showpiece for democracy. And as I said, the FEC doesn't run the election, so we don't really have a role in, uh, in that in dispelling the big lie. Uh, but I, as an individual commissioner who feel very strongly about our democracy and, and am deeply concerned about the impact on our democracy of people losing faith, losing confidence in the, in the outcome and in the process, uh, I have, to the extent that I can, use my platform to try and reassure people that it was a safe and accessible election. Yes. So wouldn't it be helpful if there were some national validator that could reassure American voters that the elections were safe and fair and accurate? Well, I think it's important to remember that a number of high ranking officials who were appointed by the former president all said that this was a fair election and that there was no evidence of widespread fraud. The attorney general, um, Bill Barr, the, uh, the head of the FBI, Chris Wray, the head of, of CISA, the uh, entity within the Department of Homeland Security that was charged with election security, Chris Krebs, they all came out and said this was a secure and fair and accessible election and there was no fraud. So talk, if you would, about your reaction to some of these state-by-state -state recounts featuring ultraviolet lights and searching for bamboo and how do, how do we address some of those issues and the fear tactics and the disinformation that's out there? Well, it's important to remember also that there uh, are procedures in place in every state to address what happened in the election, to go back and do audits and recounts. Uh, when you're going to audit an election, you want to have people who are accredited, who are experienced, who are professional. There's a role for that after elections. And most states actually do have a process in place and did those kind of uh, professional audits, professional lookbacks at the election, and found no evidence of any fraud. The, the, the cyber ninjas out in Arizona are not experienced election professionals. They have actually no experience in this. They're not neutral. They're not um, uh, experienced. They're not credentialed to do the kind of work that they're doing. Uh, there's nothing wrong with doing a post-election audit if it's done the right way. But you don't want to have just anybody walking in and taking control of your ballots and taking control of your machinery. True. Um, let's go back to campaign finance, since that is the primary focus of the FEC's work. Talk about Citizens United, if you would. And why don't you start by telling folks what it is and then what your concerns, what impact you think it's had? Citizens United uh, was the uh, corporations or people case uh, where uh, corporations were explicitly given the, uh, the same rights as human individuals to uh, engage in election speech, what we call express advocacy, to get out there and tell people who they think that people ought to vote for and vote against. And uh, the positive side of Citizens United was the part of the ruling that talked about disclosure, which at the time there were eight out of nine justices who were strongly in favor of a strong disclosure regime. The problem is when you empower corporations to get involved with, with political speech, they become a shield against disclosure. So then you have speech being made by not only business corporations, I mean, people kind of know who IBM and Microsoft and GM are uh, and, and what point of view they might be representing. But then we get into 501c4 organizations, nonprofit organizations, limited liability companies, uh, groups that have uh, ambiguous names, Americans for apple pie and mom, <laughs> and nobody knows who's behind those groups. And they spend a great deal of money in our elections and have been empowered by the Citizens United decision. And the very, very wealthy people who support those nonprofit organizations and LLCs 
uh, they are the ones who are really super empowered. So you get a class of billionaires who are out there spending millions and millions of dollars, some of them tens of millions, some of them hundreds of millions of dollars in our elections to try and influence the outcome. And uh, even the ones who are publicly reported are not household names. If I pulled up a list of the top 10 donors in the last election, most people would never have heard of most of them. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and that has been true for quite a long time. And those are the ones that we actually know about and have some information about. Then there are all the ones who are supporting these um, uh, shell groups that are set up just for the purpose of masking the identity of the people that are behind them. So that has been a big impact of uh, Citizens United that it has supercharged the power of this billionaire class of politically active individuals who may not represent the views and the needs of the rest of the population because they don't live the same lives right. that the rest of us live. Right, what's the solution? Well, you know, there's a constitutional amendment out there uh, that's been proposed to overturn Citizens United. As you know, it's very difficult to get constitutional amendment passed. There are um, a number of provisions in uh, HR1 slash S1, the big democracy reform bill in Congress that attempt to democratize campaign finance, have a, a variety of uh, proposals in there, uh, matching small dollar do uh, donations, for example, along the lines of uh, the model that was established in New York City, for example, and some other um, uh, cities have been actually out in front. Yes, yes, Montgomery County. Mm -hmm. um, uh, cities have been out there, uh, and, and counties, local groups have been uh, have been out there. Uh, being very inventive and great laboratories of democracy, and the uh, and the Congress has picked up on some of these ideas and incorporated them into a bill, and we'll see if any of that gets passed. Right. A phrase that people hear more and more, and there's an ad on TV now that's supposed to frighten us that talks about dark money. Can you describe what dark money is and uh, and what we should know about it? Well, that is exactly the problem that I was alluding to with these uh, LLCs and 501c4 organizations, 501c4 being a section of the tax code that they operate under uh, that spend money in politics, but don't tell you who's really giving them the money to spend. And again, I think it's impossible to evaluate the credibility of information if you don't know who is behind it. Um, if, if a group like the NRA or the Sierra Club is out there running ads, you know, kind of where they're coming from. And different people will have different decisions about whether they trust the views of the NRA or the Sierra Club, but at least they know where it's coming from. But when you get these groups, again, that are called, you know, Americans for Apple Pie and Mom, or as Stephen Colbert famously said, Americans for a better tomorrow tomorrow, nobody really knows who's behind the message. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we had, I'm dating myself, but if you go back to the Clinton administration, the Bill Clinton administration. There, uh, when he was trying to get healthcare uh, reform passed, there was a group that was set up, and I forget what they called themselves, but nobody could tell who was from the name of it who they were. And they ran a, a series of very effective ads that made it sound like they were representing, you know, grassroots people sitting around their kitchen table worrying about their how to pay their medical bills. And in fact, it was supported by Big Pharma. It was, um, it was Harry and Louise, or something. Yes, Harry and Louise. That was the couple sitting yeah. at their kitchen table. Yeah. Uh, but. You know, it was actually Big Pharma that was uh, that was that was bankrolling all of those ads, and I think that really does make a difference in how you evaluate the information that you're getting. We had an example here in Maryland not that long ago where there was a ballot initiative about bringing um, casino gambling mm -hmm. uh, to Maryland, and a group uh, emerged that was some called itself something like Vote No on Prop Six, something like that, and was running a bunch of ads and because I always look for the disclaimers at the end. I always look to see, you know, who's behind this. Right. And I couldn't tell, now, who is this group and, and what's, their, what's their angle on this? They talked a lot about education and whether the money would actually go to support education. And I thought, is this a teacher's group? Is it PTAs and who's behind this? Well, 
it turned out, because we have good disclosure laws in, in Maryland, people were able to learn that it was supported by a rival casino in West Virginia that didn't <laughs> want the competition from, uh, from Maryland casinos opening up. And when the ballot initiative passed, that casino was you know, one of the first in line to uh, uh, apply for a license to open a casino here in Maryland. But that really does, you know, okay, now you know, if you know that's who's funding the ad, then you know what their angle is. Like, okay, they're trying to talk me out of supporting this because they want to make the money in the next state over. Yeah. Now, that, that gives me some insight into how I evaluate the advertising. Yes. So those are about independent expenditures. Let's go back to donating directly to a campaign. Mm -hmm. So I remember in college, my con law uh, class, and we read about Buckley versus Vallejo and about campaign finance and campaign limits versus First Amendment. And if I wanna spend my own money or if I wanna raise a lot of money, I should be able to do that because that's my freedom of speech. Um, what do you think about um, limits and caps and whether they should be adjusted over the years? Anything about uh, who can give and how much? Well, the system that the Supreme Court has handed us, they, they as you know, in, in Buckley v. Vallejo, they upheld a bunch of this, this new comprehensive Federal Election Campaign Act that uh, for the first time tried to bring a bunch of provisions together into one place, uh, regulating campaign finance, but they struck down other provisions. So they approved the contribution limits on the basis that, and this is still the law, that unlimited contributions going directly to candidates posed an inherent risk of corruption. And right now the contribution limit is $2,900 uh, per election per, from any one individual going to a candidate. Uh, but they said you can't have expenditure limits because that would limit political speech. Mm -hmm. So first of all, I'll just say that I don't entirely accept the notion that money is the same thing as speech mm -hmm. because that super empowers the people who have more money. Why should they get more speech? Because they have more money. Why should their views get more uh, play than, uh, than other views that might be equally valid and equally informative to the electorate? It's interesting that in Canada, when their Supreme Court considered a similar law, they came to the opposite conclusion. Also in pursuit of the same goal, the most robust political debate, that's what everybody wants or says they want. Uh, and what the Canadian Supreme Court said was, if you have no limits on the amount of spending, then the side with more money can drown out the other side. And then the voters will be deprived of the opportunity to fairly assess the arguments on both sides of an issue. So that, they upheld spending limits, our Supreme Court struck them down. Mm -hmm. uh, and if there's no spending limits, but there are contribution limits, then there's gonna be a lot of pressure on the system to, uh, to raise a lot of money. You have a situation where candidates have to spend hours and hours every day on the phone, trying to drum up the money. Uh, and, and we have a system now because of Citizens United where these super PACs have become very, very powerful. And um, most candidates are kind of looking over their shoulder to see who might run against them on their flank, particularly in a primary, particularly in safe seats. If we had better redistricting reform, if we had uh, nonpartisan commissions, independent commissions who were drawing the lines instead of the politicians themselves, all due respect, um, <laughs> then we would have more districts where there, that were more competitive. So instead of the big race being the primary, right. we have to be able to compete in the general. Yeah. And when the big race is the primary, because the seat is solidly red or blue, and this happens on both sides, Absolutely. what you tend to get are more extreme candidates who then have a harder time coming together and enacting policy when they get into office. I agree. So, so the conversation in Annapolis on redistricting has been about hoping for some action at the federal level. Uh, I kind of am in a, an odd situation because I'm embarrassed by Maryland's current congressional uh, map but I wasn't in office to vote for it or debate about it or vote against it. Uh, but why should Maryland sort of unilaterally disarm if Texas and North Carolina and others are drawing squiggly terrible maps that favor Republicans? And so uh, that's where majority rule uh, ends up generally drawing districts and uh, independent and commissions are a great idea but they have to truly be fair and everywhere. Yes. And, and then, you know, we see in, um, you know, the lines are 
interesting in in Maryland, but uh, I think in Maryland we're talking about a swing of you know maybe one seat, yes. um, even with the worst possible gerrymander. There are there are states where a majority of people vote for one party, and the other party ends up with a supermajority in their state legislature. Yes, which then adopts. This year, we're seeing a rash of new voting laws and election laws being proposed around the country that will make it even harder for people to vote and, and for candidates to compete fairly. So well, let's talk about what's important. going on in Georgia, in Texas, and in too many other places. Is there a little d democratic solution to legislation that is clearly designed to, um, to squash and reduce access to the franchise, to people's at right to vote? Well, I think that people ought to make their concerns known to their state legislatures, but the, the, it's, a, it's a problem when one side has control of the state house, the state senate, and the governorship, it is very difficult for anybody on the other side to get their voices heard. And that's why we saw what we saw in Texas, where the only way that they could um, uh, have an effect was for a bunch of Democratic lawmakers to walk out, mm -hmm. uh, which is you know not an ideal solution, but they were facing, uh, I, I think, some very bad choices there yes. because that law, there's there's one section of that law that was uh, proposed in Texas that is actually captioned uh, overturning elections. Now that is a scary proposition because not only are some of these bills making it harder for people to vote, but they are also affecting who gets to count the votes and how the um, who gets to judge which ballots are valid and which ballots aren't, um, who gets to uh, choose who the electors are who will go to the electoral college. There's the, I have some real concerns about uh, making the administration of the elections, which as I said, worked so well last time, yes. whether it was Democrats or Republicans in charge of the election apparatus last time across the country, we had terrific results uh, in terms of administration. Yes. Uh, and to take the decision-making about how to, how to run the election, how to count the votes, whose votes get counted out of the hands of professional election administrators and the people who were elected to do that job and instead hand it over to state legislators yes. uh, who have a, a partisan uh, ax to grind, that is, I think, very concerning. And the whole idea that someone who thinks they might have reason to believe there could hypothetically be fraud, so therefore the loser is now the winner, yeah. Crazy. Well, um, as you know, there were there were dozens of lawsuits. There were over sixty lawsuits after the last election, and um, virtually every one of them, the uh, the complaints were just thrown out. Thrown out. There was no evidence, even by Republican judges yes. against the Trump team, which is should have been a wake up call. But um, so a lot of new developments, vote by mail and drop boxes. You referenced. Um, easier access to early voting, longer hours, drive-through voting. Uh, what do you think will last post-COVID? Um, anything that you saw that you didn't like that you think shouldn't be shouldn't continue in the future? Well, I, I what I saw was all of those things arising all throughout the country because people were looking for ways to help people vote safely mm -hmm. and. As I said, there was no evidence of any kind of fraud that would have affected the outcome. I like it when more people vote. We had huge turnout in the uh, record-breaking turnout in the last election. And I think that we always ought to be in favor of more people voting because then the government that we get will be representative of more of the people. So I would like that. I would like to see all of these methods of voting expanded. They are, um, they are under attack in state legislatures based on um, claims of fraud that have not been substantiated. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the problem is that now millions of people have been taken in by this story that there was fraud in the elections last time and something needs to be done to fix it. And uh, a lot of these methods of fixing it are going to have a disproportionate impact on people of color. Yes. So I think it's bad when when anybody is discouraged from voting or it's harder for any citizen to exercise their franchise. But given our history, it is particularly abhorrent to enact provisions that are going to have a disproportionate impact on on people of color. It just it's it's unconscionable. 
Yes. I have a few more questions and then we'll get to, uh, to our fast five. Um, cyber attacks. Uh, do you want to speak to security of our election system? Um, well, so far, um, while we have had our political debate somewhat polluted by uh, people from abroad trying to infiltrate and pose as Americans, and, and uh, you know that happened more in 2016 than in 2020, but so far we have not seen any evidence of um, uh, actually changing vote counts, um, cyber attacks on the voting machinery that, that had any kind of impact. But this is obviously something that is uh, of great concern. I know the Department of Homeland Security was working closely with election uh, administrators across the country on shoring up their cyber defenses. And this is something that we have to keep our eye on and continue to put resources into. Yes. Um, we have always been a role model around the world for our election system. Has, how has that been eroded in this past cycle? Um, can we continue to be a beacon for democracy and suggest to other countries how they should run their elections? Well, I think that very much depends on what we do going forward. I have had the privilege of representing the United States and in international conferences and talking to international visitors to this country about how our election system works. And I was always very proud to be that person, to be able to uh, show how our system works. And um, I, I think particularly after January 6th, what, what happened, uh, it becomes a lot harder to say that, um, you know, we've got all the guardrails in place that we need to secure our democracy. One of the bedrock aspects of a healthy democracy is that people have to have faith. They have to have confidence that the system works and that the votes uh, will be counted fairly and people who are entitled to vote will have that opportunity to vote. Um, and when we lose that, and I think that it has been under attack in the last number of years, it is very, very hard to rebuild. Yeah, yeah, true. Um, ranked choice voting, what are your thoughts? Um, I am uh, mildly in favor of it. I think it's worth exploring. Um, I will be interested to see how it works in practice. I, uh, and there, uh, there's a very interesting mayoral race in New York that where they're going to be using ranked choice voting. Uh, the notion is that you get less extreme candidates as a as a result. But um, I haven't seen enough actual election results using that method to to know for sure how it's going to play out. So I have sponsored a bill authorizing it in Montgomery County if the county council and county executive agree to it, and we could use that as a laboratory. We'll see if that ever moves forward. Um, if you had a magic wand, what would you change about our election system? Oh boy. Um, uh, I, would, I would do something about dark money. I would try and empower small donors rather than the billionaires. Uh, I would uh, try, if I had a magic wand, I would, I would convince people that the election really was fair and accurate and secure, uh, because I really do worry about this crisis of faith in our democracy. Yeah, agreed. All right, well, Commissioner Ellen Weintraub, here comes your fast five. Five quick questions to let people know a little bit more about you. So first off, uh, what is your proudest accomplishment in your career so far? Um, you know, it's interesting. There was a time when I would have pointed to, you know, perhaps a, a regulation or um, uh, a big case that maybe we concluded well, but I think really it's just standing up for the democracy and trying to be a voice for truth and for uh, fairness in our elections. You have been extraordinary at that. Thank you. Uh, question two, if you could travel anywhere in time, which decade would you choose and why? Um, in time? Well, uh, it would be a little bit scary, but maybe I'd go a few decades into the future and see what happens. Great. What the democracy looks like. Let's hope we still have one, right? <laughs> um, Question three, what makes you laugh? Um, spending time with my children makes me happy and 
is usually a source of, of laughter and mirth. Great. Who is your Shiro and why? Well, you know, I suppose the standard answers are, um, you know, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Sonia Sotomayor, um, Elena Kagan, Sandy Day O'Connor too, you know, she was, she was excellent on campaign finance. Uh, she got it. She was a former uh, politician, but also people like um, Cheryl and Eiffel and uh, Kristen Clark and Benita Gupta, who are now in the Justice Department, who have been fighting for voting rights uh, for, for years now and just standing up for what's right. So I have to give a shout out, Sherry Eiffel and I were ambassador together. So I'm She's proud of my, of my fellow- uh, Heather McGee also. She's also been a great voice talking about equality. Fantastic. And the last question, the fifth question, the one I ask everyone, Commissioner Ellen Weintraub, what is your hidden secret superpower? What is something you're really good at that most folks can't do? I don't know if I'd call it a superpower. I, 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 I think I'm reasonably good at public speaking, at talking to folks on TV and just trying to explain the law to folks. I think that's true. Well, Madam Commissioner, thank you for your work. Thank you for your dedication to democracy, for your outspoken, important, measured and thoughtful voice here and uh, more importantly on, on TV and in other uh, in other venues, you are making a difference through your work. And I am grateful for your taking time to uh, kibitz with me today. Thank you so much, Cheryl. And thanks for the kibitz. Absolutely. And I got to give a shout out to uh, my friend and constituent, Tom Moore, who works with you and helps set Jesus. this up. He's a former Rockville uh, town, uh, city council member and, uh, and a great guy. So yes. we got to yes. include him here. So. Thank you so much. Uh, look forward to seeing you in Annapolis or on TV or in person before too long. Take care, Cheryl. Stay safe. Take care. You too. Bye-bye.